study uh, from the book The Promise of the Spirit, which is put out by Bethany Fellowship. Uh, the Promise of the Spirit is uh, a collection of Charles Finney's writings uh, from his newsletter called The Oberlin Evangelist which he put out specifically because his body was worn out from preaching and his, he said his, quote, organs of speech were worn out. Uh, he lost his voice. He couldn't preach. He says, and because my organs of speech and body is worn out, I intend to come to you through the press so that I can preach to more, even so, through this way. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, the third chapter of about 25 if I remember right, maybe 22, uh, on his study of the promise of Jesus of the Holy Spirit. And uh, this doesn't really tie in except for the attitude of the heart. And that's what in your DTS and in our ICT we're trying to develop is the attitude of the heart, that it be proper. And, and uh, proper meaning the only attitude that will reach God. Now, uh, let me just say that many of you know me as a piano player, musician, and uh, very few of you have ever met me before, and you might have trouble, uh, you know, because of you have had some image of who I am or what I am or whatever. Um, let me just say that, that I live in a world where I struggle. I live in a world where I'm growing, striving, uh, trying to rest in the Lord as much as you do, maybe more so because of the pressures put upon me. Uh, that doesn't mean I achieve more than you do. It means that I might struggle more than you do. Uh, but, uh, you know, God gives a measure of grace to each person as they need it. And so uh, I have the same God you do and the same Bible you do. That's what Leonard Ravenhill always says, you know. One thing about Charles, we always talk about Charles Wesley. and I mean, John Wesley, Charles was there too. And Charles Finney and Martin Luther, he says, but you know what, their Bible wasn't any bigger than ours. <laughs> And their God didn't love them any more than he loves us. So we can do things that he did and they did. And, and that's something to remember that uh, we think of the great men and those were the good old days and I wish things were like that now. Well, you sure got, you sure say a lot to God when you say stuff like that. And you're saying to him that you don't really believe he's the same anymore. And uh, there's some, how many people have read Charles Finney before? Okay. Okay. Uh, some of you might, uh, when you read our newsletter, how many people get our newsletter here? Well, <clears throat> okay, well, we'll have you sign up at the end here. Uh, 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 some people who have been on our mailing list for some time, we, we try to print something by our brother Chuck here, uh, oh, about once every two or three issues, mainly because his writings are so archaic as far as the phraseology that he used. We try to put them into modern English uh, because they're hard to read. He was a lawyer. And this was preached. Uh, this was written in 1839, almost 150 years ago, and his language was so. Uh, and he was considered the. He, he spoke in the common language of the day of the people, but they were so much more uh, vocal. And they didn't have television and radio and a bunch of jive to soak their minds up like pickled prunes. Uh, that they learned, you know, our, the common man's vocabularies today is only 2,000 words. You know that? And those that, and, and I haven't read the statistics, but I can tell from the words that he preached just to the common people on the street that uh, it had to be at least double that. I mean, he uses words that curl my hair, you know. And... Uh, uh, you know, I can't even find some of them. Look what happened, you know. I just, you know. So, uh, another thing is people think uh, we preach and, you know, live and breathe finny. We're kind of on a one-string fiddle, you know. Uh, all I want to say is that this man is somebody we respect, that he's not our guru or anything. Uh, he's somebody that we respect in a, in a way that... Uh, uh, well, just kind of like... Uh, kind of like a, uh, a spiritual guidance counselor. This guy seemed to go places that I want to go. And I'm not talking about deeds. I'm talking about in prayer. I'm talking about he went, he, he entered into the Spirit of God. He entered into, the, into uh, the presence of God and got the power of God in such a way that I would like to, as Paul said, be imitators of him in the sense that he knew something that I don't know. And... Uh, 
God revealed certain things to him. He wasn't a mystic. He wasn't some some great spiritual leader, but he certainly loved God and he loved people. And he got he came back out of the presence of God with some incredible insight. Now, how many people here think they know what devotion is? Okay, good. Well, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, I the, this is from a t an article just titled "Devotion" by Charles Finney. I renamed it. Uh, we're going to print this in the next newsletter. Devotions or devotion. And we're going to put devotions in quotes. Well, I forgot to do that on your copy. Devotions should be in quotes. Uh, I, I love when I hear when I hear people say, uh, you know, well, I, I did my devotions this morning. You know, I, don't, I don't even use that word after reading this anymore. And you'll see why. Let's go ahead and, and read through it and we'll discuss it. Okay, um... First, the scriptures that he uses. He always start out with scripture. That's a good place to start. Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever you do, do it heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now, these scriptures reveal the true nature of what devotion to God really is. In discussing this subject, I, Finney's talking here, I propose to show, one, what true devotion to God is not, two, what true devotion to God is, three, that devotion and nothing short of devotion is true religion, that's what the word he used, and uh, true Christianity, and four, several mistakes commonly made upon this subject. Going back over those four things, Finney, when he taught about some, what something was, the first thing he did was destroy every misconception that he could think of, what people thought it was, that it really wasn't. In fact, the best thing you can do to find out what a, what a thing is, is first to find out what it isn't. Because so many people think that love is something, for instance, you know. Uh, in fact, he's got studies on love, and he starts out just like this. He tells you what love isn't. It isn't an emotional gushing of desire for anything, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, three, when he says that devotion and nothing short of devotion is true Christianity. Uh, in his day, the word religion had a meaning of... Uh, the word. If you were a religious man, you were a Christian in his day and age. There weren't Buddhists and Muslims running around in New York in 1830. They, you know, they would have been buried him somewhere, I think. Um, there was, uh, in fact, uh, during the American Independent War, uh, War of Independence, uh, I remember reading something that, uh, by Thomas Jefferson or something, that there was a group of 70 Jews on the island, uh, the isle, yeah, the island of Manhattan, and that they wouldn't let them vote. You know, they were anathema. Uh, like, imagine, you know, Today in New York, there's only 70 Jews when the you know the country came. There's there's more Jews in there's more Jews in New York City than there are in all of Israel. You know that? There's also you know I think there's more Italians there than there are in Rome. Um, now don't quote me on that last one, but I know the first one's true. There's more pizza there than a pizza man. Shakey's. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, that's, so I, I inter whenever Finney uses the word true religion or, uh, this man has no religion, he's talking about that the man's not a Christian, that the man is not really serving God, and that's, when Finney used the word religion, it's synonymous with being a real Christian, okay? One, what true devotion to God is not. Devotion does not consist of reading the Bible, nor praying, nor attending meetings. These may or may not be specific instances of devotion, but are not to be regarded as devotion itself. It's pretty clear. Two, devotion does not consist of a private or public commitment of our lives to God. These are to be regarded as special acts, pledges or promises of devotion, but not as devotion itself. Now, uh, going over the first one, of course, people think, that reading their Bible, reading, you know, five chapters in the morning and, and, and spending five minutes with God and making sure they go to the prayer meeting on Wednesday and to the morning service and if there's nothing good on TV, the evening service on Sunday 
is devotions. This is my devotions. God knows I mean business. Finney you know, just destroys that. That's not devotion at all. They can be what he calls instances of devotion or deeds of devotion, but they are in themselves do not constitute devotion. And uh, in the second one, many people think that uh, when a guy in his, in his prayer closet goes, Oh God, I commit my life to you, that that's devotion. Or they come forward at the, at the concert, or they come forward at the meeting, or at the, at the sermon on Sunday morning, and they, say, and they say, who here wants to devote their life to God? And five people come forward, and they say the old sinner's prayer. And they say, well, I really made an oath of devotion today. Well, that's true. You made an oath of devotion, or a promise of devotion. But that in itself is not devotion. Okay? Three. Devotion does not consist of individual acts or exercises of any kind. These may indeed be devotional acts, that is, acts of devotion, but let it be remembered that no acts or exercises in themselves constitute devotion. Okay, that's, he's pretty thorough. Two, what true devotion to God is? Devotion is that state of the heart in which everything, our whole life, being and possessions, are a continual offering to God. That is, they are continually devoted to God. True devotion must be the supreme devotion of the will, extending out to all we have and are, to all times, places, employments, thoughts, and feelings. Now here he, he uh, does what Jesus does as far as using a parable. Let your own ideas of what a pastor ought to be illustrate my meaning. You most likely believe that a pastor in preaching the gospel should have only one purpose in mind, to glorify God by the salvation and later the sanctification of sinners. Since he professes to be a servant of God, you feel that he ought to study, preach, and perform all his ministerial duties, not for himself, not for his salary, not to increase his popularity, but only to glorify God. Now, you can easily see that if he does not have this singleness of purpose or singleness of eye, his service cannot be acceptable to God, for it is not an offering to God, it is not a devotion to God, but a devotion to himself. Now, we're not going to just read here, if some of you thinking, well, he's just going to read this, I could read this myself. Uh, we're going to stop when we get past this and discuss this. Devotion, then, in a pastor is that state of mind in which all his pastoral duties are performed for the glory of God and where his whole life is a continual offering to God. Again, you feel that a minister ought to be as devoted to God in everything else as he is in praying or preaching. And in this you are right. For he not only ought to be but really is only as devoted in the pulpit as he is out of the pulpit. If he is influenced by selfish and worldly motives during the week, then these same motives are surely in his heart on the Sabbath. If during the week his thoughts are centered upon his own interests, endeavoring to promote himself, you can be sure it's the same on the Sabbath. You most likely also feel that if a minister's devotion is merely an outward farce, that he preaches, prays, visits, and performs all his duties, mainly for the purpose of supporting his family or to get honor and attention for himself, you would say that he is, was a wicked man and unless he is converted, he would inevitably lose his soul. If these are your views on the subject, they are undoubtedly correct. Well, let's stop here. Um, the standard of righteousness, the standard of truth, is black and white. There's two things that are in opposition. The Bible says mercy and judgment. Right? It says that mercy rejoices against judgment. Why? There are, the law of God is black and white. The justice of God is black and white. The judgment of God is black and white. You're either righteous or you're not. The love of God is not black and white. The mercy of God is not black and white. The kindness of God. Behold, the kindness and the severity of our God. It's in Romans. These are things that Christians have struggled with since the beginning days. That God has seemingly two ways of looking at you. One is through the law and one is through love. And that doesn't mean the law came from hatred. 
the law is not necessarily the Mosaic law that you know you, you're not supposed to eat pork chops, you know, and so on. The law is be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. That's the law. That's a command. Be perfect. And when you're not perfect, you fail the law. You fail God's standard. His standard is that you must be perfect. That's his standard. You must have a perfect devotion to him, a perfect love. Perfect love casteth out fear, it says. And here Finney's talking about, to make a point about you, he's talking about what you think a pastor should be. Now, in his day, there was the men of the cloth and the laity, right? There was the preachers and the people in the pews. I always wondered why they called them pews, and I found out when I went to church for a while. Because the heart character of the Christian stinks in most cases. They're waiting for the pastor to do everything. They're waiting, really. They're waiting for the pastor to go door to door and lead people to the Lord. They're waiting for the pastor to do all the marriage counseling and all the abortion counseling and all solve all the problems of everybody. That's not a pastor's job. A pastor's job is to be an example of Jesus so that people can be raised up around him just like Jesus. So that the abortion counseling and the opening of the homes to people can be spread throughout the body of Christ. Pastors are to be leaders. Christians are not not to just be followers. There, remember it says that I am the door and everyone who comes in through the door becomes a shepherd of the sheep. It says that in John 10. Everyone who comes in through the door, who enters by me, becomes that he becomes a shepherd of the sheep. When you become a Christian, you instantly become a follower and a leader at the same time. If you don't realize that, if you think... Now, I know many of you here are DTS, and you've paid a good sum of money, which nobody likes to mention, but you've paid a good sum of money to come here and live and learn about Jesus and learn about what it's like to be a Christian to be and to be a leader, to be a disciple, discipleship training school. Our school's called Intensive Christian Training. It's kind of like something you put out of a bottle and soften your hands up. I'm... I'm sure that you came here, most of you, thinking that you are going to leave a better person, right? I mean, you know, it's a lot of money. It's a long time out of your life. You want to be a better person. You, you'd be an idiot to come here and not think you're going to be better because of all the knowledge and all the love and prayers and concern and counsel you're going to receive here. Some of you look bored. Some of you look filled up like a sponge that can't hold anything else. How many weeks have you been here now? Five weeks. Some of you feel like, man, it's filled up to here, and everything that comes in this area just floats on the top and pours out the other side. <laughs> and I, I want to tell you something. That's the way knowledge is. Knowledge, puffet, up. The letter kills. It murders. The spirit gives life. The letter kills. Knowledge pops up. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon, who I think wrote Ecclesiastes, says, excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. When all is said and done, this is what you should know. Fear God and keep his commandments. <laughs> Well, you can all go back home now. <laughs> Finney's using a pastor here because most people think the pastor is supposed to be a different class of Christian. That is an insidious thought. Now, it does say in James, Be not many teachers, knowing that you shall be judged with greater strictness. In the King James, it says, You shall incur the greater condemnation. Well, that's scary. That only means one thing. Knowledge equals responsibility, equals accountability, equals condemnability. The more you know, the bigger your punishment if you don't live up to what you know. Or as many Christians like to say nowadays, to the light that you have, living up to the light that you have. Don't get more light. Be afraid of getting more light if the light that you have has turned to darkness in you. And if the light that is within you is darkness, 
you're in trouble. Now, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to thrust the law down your nostrils. I'm here to talk about the standard because the standard must be kept high. We should never, ever look. Even if, you know, Catherine Booth said, I have said since I'm 12 years old, since I'm a little girl, I will never, ever lower the standard, even if it sends me to hell. I will not lower it. And that's what happens. People invent doctrines because they can't live up to the standard. They invent these crazy doctrines. You know, these, these wonderful doctrines that say, you can go to heaven though you live a life of sin and you don't have to be changed outwardly as long as you get stamped USDA choice Christian on the forehead when you say the same prayer. Now, I'm sure they've dispelled that in the first five weeks of this school. The fundamentalist movement in this country, which, which, which I'm not against, fundamental, the word fundamental means basic truths, has got people believing in some cases, that you as a Christian can get saved, whatever that means. I mean, my Bible says you're supposed to be saved from what? From sin, you know. But so you get saved, which means you, you get your brownie stars on your soul that only God can read. And from this point on, no matter what you do, God overlooks it because, you know, your sins are forgiven past, present, and future, and no matter what you do, you can't go to hell anymore. Well, I got news for you, and this might curl your hair. I can go to hell if I want to, and God isn't going to stop me unless I ask him to, or I contain and remain in that relationship with him, which he wants me to stay in that relationship with him. He's drawing me. He's keeping me. But if I want to go to hell bad enough, he's got to let me, or else there's no virtue in being a Christian. There's no virtue in following Jesus. No one would have been lost. And this pastor that Finney's talking about here, this pastor that he's talking about, this guy has got a standard that's not living up to the gospel. The guy that's, that's preaching to get support for his family. You can't become a Christian to make money. Oh, God, I know people making a fortune off the gospel. I know people that are living in mansions because they got saved and they found an idea and Christians, gullible enough, put it on the back of their bumper. Man, they're merchandising Christ. Then I know singers and musicians that God gave them a talent. God gave them a talent before they even knew Jesus. They used it to serve themselves then, and they use it to serve themselves now. And they build up their own kingdom with it. And I'm sure there's people out there that think that I do the same. And God knows my heart, and and that's I'm not here to defend myself. I'm here to defend the gospel. It's harsh, and it's soft. It's severe, and it's kind. It's black and white, but love goes into the gray to separate out the black from the white. I'm trying to make a point. Finney gives you a standard and you shudder. The Bible does too, in many cases. Be perfect. There's none righteous, not even one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. Our Savior will not save us against our will. One, two, he will not cleanse us against our will. He'll, he draws us, he draws us, he wants us. We just talked about, and the reason Finney talked about a pastor is because he knows that Christians being, you know, remember Jesus called Christians his sheep? You know why he called them his sheep? Because sheep are the dumbest animals in the animal kingdom. They are. There is no animal in the animal, no mammal that has a lower IQ than a sheep. He didn't say, these are my dolphins. Behold, wash my chimpanzees. You know, keep, keep, keep my German shepherds. He, you know, he could have he could have said anything that would have given intelligence to the creature, but he says, no, nope. these these people are so gullible. If you tell them they're a plate of French fries, they'll believe it. <laughs> really, you know, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, Jesus, that's hard. I mean, I can't think of eating your flesh, man. They don't, be, you know. 
He tells his disciples, you know, beware of eleven of the Pharisees. Hey man, nobody brought any sandwiches, you know. <laughs> no, not bread. Sin, sin, you know. I mean, he had these people with him called human beings, just like you and me, that had thick skulls a mile wide. Called them his sheep. That was it. It's a pretty good sense of humor, I think. <laughs> They go, oh, isn't that cute, cheap little woolly bag? She just goes, yeah, and dumb, too. You know? <laughs> you know? He says, you know, you still don't understand? Remember how many times Jesus said that? You still don't understand? Do I still have to explain it to you? Jesus, what that, what that parable mean, man? One plus one equals two. The parable of the sower, the sower is me, and the word of God is the seed, and golly, can't you understand anything? I mean, it seems like sometimes he's exasperated, doesn't it? Not in the flesh. Just exasperated. Just kind of fed up that these people who he's... Remember how many times he says, I'm going to die, and on the third day I'm going to be raised up. Right? Three days. He always said it. The Son of Man shall be crucified and raised on the third day. I think... You know what to think the saddest day of Jesus' life is? What? It's the resurrection. What? Easter? You know, we all sing... We all sing how glorious and how wonderful that day is. That was the saddest day of his life because he told him that he's going to raise on the third day. He got out of the grave. Da da! And no one was there. All these thick skulls people. He told him three days. No one was there. This one woman who was devoted comes out. She didn't come out to see a risen Jesus. She came out to to make his grave nice and smell sweet and you know. Anoint his body with, you know, she was, she believed he was dead, and she gets the credit for, you know, seeing you. She believed it. Well, you would have too. Anybody would have believed it when they saw it. All the, even Don and Thomas believed it when Jesus said, stick it in my side. What I'm trying to say to you is this. A pastor is somebody we expect to be a Christian. A real good look, and he's a pastor. Look what he's doing. Hey, God says, he's a Christian, and look what he's doing. That's all God said. I love the thing in, well, you might not be able to find it, but it says, you feel that a, a past a minister ought to be as devoted to God in everything else as he is in praying or preaching. In this you are right, for he not only ought to be, but really is, only as devoted in the pulpit as he is out of it. Okay. You most likely feel that if a minister's devotion is merely an outward farce that he preaches, prays, visits, performs all his duties, merely for the purpose of, purpose of supporting his family or to get honor or attention for himself, you would say that he was a wicked man. And he would inevitably lose his soul. Those were the days. These were the theological days when people were wicked men, they lost their soul. <laughs> you know, if you were a wicked man, you lost your soul. Today, you can be a wicked man and go to heaven. Really. You, get your, you, get your, you join the Jesus Club, you get your card in your wallet, and you go to heaven. doesn't matter. God pulls you over for speeding and sinning, and you hand your car out, hey, you know, i got connections, you know. If these are your views on the subject, they are undoubtedly correct. Here where you have no personal interest, you form a right judgment and decide correctly concerning the character and destiny of such a man. Now remember, nothing short of this standard is devotion in you, too. Bear it in mind that no particular acts or zeal or gushings of emotion or resolutions to change or promises of future obedience constitute devotion. For devotion is that state of the will in which the mind is swallowed up in God as the object of its supreme affection, in which we not only live and move in God, but for God. In other words, devotion is that state of the mind in which the attention is diverted from self and self-seeking and is directed to God, the thoughts, purposes, desires, affections, and emotions, all hanging upon and devoted to Him. By the way, you can write on these papers, they're yours. I should have told you that before. You can make notes on the side or underline or circle or make crossword puzzles or whatever you want to. Okay, let's read that last paragraph again. Devotion is that state of the will in which the mind is swallowed up in God as the object of its supreme affection. That's beautiful. In which we not only live and move in God, but for God. In other words, devotion is that state of the mind in which 
the attention is diverted from self and self-seeking and is directed to God, the thoughts, purposes, desires, affections, and emotions all hanging upon and devoted to Him. Okay. Devotion and nothing short of devotion is true religion, as Finney would say, is true Christianity. Devotion and true religion are identical. <laughs> That's quite a statement. Devotion and being a Christian are identical. One, it is impossible for us not to be devoted to the object of our supreme affection. Read that sentence and look at it. It's very important. It is impossible for us not to be devoted to the object of our supreme affection. The word supreme means our highest the one we love the most. If we love God the most, he will be the reason for which we live. If an individual loves God supremely, he will be as conscious that he lives for God as that he lives at all. <laughs> Nothing short of this can be acceptable to God, unless devotion be a habit or a state of the mind, unless the whole being be an offering to God, he must have a rival in our hearts. This he will not endure, and to, to attempt to please him by isolated acts of devotion, when it is not the habit and state of our minds, is far more abominable than for a wife to attempt to please her husband with an occasional smile while she lives only to please and gain the affections of another man. That means something very... Look at this. To attempt to please him by isolated acts of devotion is far more abominable than for a wife to attempt to please her husband with an occasional smile when she lives only to please and gain the affections of another man. What does that mean? It's far more abominable. That means this. If you, if your devotion to God is not a habit, it's not a state of mind, it's not something you live and dwell and have your, move, you move and have your being in, then to go before God and do your five chapters or one chapter or 20 minutes or five minutes of prayer a day is abominable to Him. Just as much as if you were married and you knew your wife really loved another guy, or your husband really loved another girl. Like they said, I'll marry you, but if Fred ever comes back, I'm splitting, you know, or something like that. And, and, and she kissed you, and she says, dear, I, I love you, and she smiled at you and was nice to you. You'd hate it. You'd hate the niceness. You'd hate the smiles. You'd hate the kisses. You'd hate the hugs if you knew her heart belonged to someone else, wouldn't you? I mean, it would be sick to you if you knew that she really in her heart wanted to be with another person beside you and that that was her desire and her motive was to find this guy and win him. But yet she did her duty to you as a wife. Man, it made me want to throw up. I couldn't sleep. I had a nervous breakdown. That's the way it is when our hearts belong to the world or belong to our family, or belong to our husbands or wives, or our children, or our finances, or our education, or our ministry. Our hearts belong to something even godly on the outside, spiritual. That's the worst kind of sickness. The Pharisees had that. And we still do all the deeds that we think are pleasing God, <laughs> and really, we believe in our hearts. We fooled ourselves, and now we think we can fool God with all these religious deeds and acts, and it's sick to him. According to revelations, it makes him want to puke. I wish you were hot or cold, but since you're merely lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. The word in Greek ain't spit. It isn't spew. It's vomit. Look it up. It's right there in the... If you have a New American Standard Dictionary, it's, it's on the side. It's a little, one of those little footnotes. It says literally, Vomit. That means you make God sick to his stomach with your religion, with your, com with your commitment to him, because it isn't real. You're sitting on the fence. If this is you, if you're trying to please him with what's called isolated acts of devotion, when it's not the habit and state of your mind. Okay. Three. A departure from this state of devotion is heart apostasy. The word apostasy means something that has lost its heat and is now just like, it's like waxed fruit. You know how good that waxed fruit can look when you're fasting? You know, you think it's going to taste good. You know. But it, you know it doesn't, so you don't desire it. Whatever a man's outward behavior may be, the moment he turns aside from sincere devotion to God, 
from a supreme consecration of his whole being to the service of God. He has in his heart renounced true Christianity. He is no longer in the service of God, but is serving the object upon which his heart is set. And this is the object of his devotion, that is, it is his God. Whatever his heart is set upon becomes his God. Four, several mistakes commonly made upon this subject. One, many imagine that there is a real difference between devotional and other kinds of duties. Now, this is really heavy. If you don't get this, you're going to miss the whole study. Many imagine that there is a real difference between devotional duties and other kinds of duties. As if a man could be doing his duty in that which is not devotion to God. Duty meaning obligation. Like a guy that says, it's my duty to put bread on the table. It's my duty to, to support my family. You know, So I'm going to go do my devotions and then I'm going to go out and support my family. The duties of devotion are generally supposed to be prayer and reading the scriptures together with singing and praying in the fellowship of God's house on the Sabbath. Oh, uh, God's house. On the Sabbath, men imagine themselves to be devotional, while on weekdays, except for those few acts they call their devotions, they are serving themselves and are supremely devoted to their own interests. Now, all such ideas arise out of a total absence of true devotion, and individuals who entertain such views do not yet understand what true Christianity is. Nothing is duty if it is not performed for God. That means nothing, there's nothing that you have to do if it isn't performed for God. And God doesn't, isn't pleased that you're supporting your family, or paying your debts, or, or brushing your teeth, if you're not doing it for Him. A man that is truly religious is as devotional in his daily business as he is on the Sabbath. The business of the world is performed by him with the same spirit and purpose as he prays, reads his Bible, and attends worship on the Sabbath. If this is not the case, he has no true religion. He has no true religion. Now, there are some people who really live for God. Oh, okay, let's stop there. Um, I want to say that there's, the, after reading Finney for a while, I never really saw this. I thought that there was a religious part of my life and a secular part of my life. I really did. I mean, it's a, it's a common way to think. I thought that my prayer life was, was sanctified and my Bible study was before God. But, you know, my brushing the teeth, going to the bathroom, eating, you know. I mean, I knew there was a scripture whether you eat or drink to offer the glory of God, but how to eat a hot dog for God, you know. And I knew there were recreational times, play volleyball or ping pong or, or, God forbid, cards. And can you do that for God? You know, well, according, according to the Bible, anything that can be done in a right spirit is being done for God, for the right motive, for the right purpose. And we're going to talk more about those things in a minute. But I just want to say, it is idiocy, and I was an idiot, when I thought that there was my Christian part of my life and then my business obligations. Uh-uh. If you're a Christian businessman, and boy, is that word misused today. If you're a Christian businessman, and you don't do your business as you would do it with Jesus Christ himself. You know how if you're, you're a businessman, right? And if Jesus came into the store, you'd give him the best deal. In fact, you probably wouldn't even make a profit, you know? After a while, you'd have to make a little one to support your family, because that's God's will for you to support your family. But if Jesus came into the store, you wouldn't sell him the crummy tape machine. You know, you wouldn't give him the thing with the high markup so he'd make the biggest profit. You wouldn't sell him the day-old bread and not say it was day-old. You wouldn't do the little tricks that businessmen do to make a little bit extra with him. And it says that if you don't do your business as a worship unto the Lord, you're just a flaming hypocrite. That's what the Pharisees did. They prayed, oh man, they prayed, nobody's prayed as good as them. Nobody. They had praying down. They went to prayer 101 and 102 in college. They learned it. They had giving down, man. You know, and they'd write their check out, oh, I'm giving to God. You know, drop it in the treasury. They had giving down. You know? They had prayer down. They had the scriptures down, man. They knew it backwards and forwards, just like the devil. But they didn't have worship down. They didn't have devotion down. 
They didn't have commitment to God down. I think it's important that you realize that Christianity... Now, you've heard this. I want to be a full-time Christian, not just a Sunday Christian. There is no such thing as anything else but a full-time Christian. That's like saying, I'm going to be a man on Sunday, and then the rest of the week I'll be a girl. That's how stupid it is. It's, it's idiocy. Two, and this is really an important part here, too. Now, there are some people who really live for God and are obviously in a devotional state of mind who do not seem to realize that every act devoted to God is as acceptable to him as prayer or praise. That means that there aren't first-class acts to God and second-class acts. There aren't two-star activities and three-star activities. That means that prayer as itself is not really any more spiritual than taking a bath or playing volleyball. Now, that doesn't mean you should quit praying and play volleyball. Because the Bible commands us to make our petitions known before the Lord and pray without ceasing. Obedience is one of the most pleasing things to God, but only for the right motives. If by necessary responsibilities these people that have a right state of mind are kept from spending much time in prayer or going to a lot of meetings, Satan takes advantage of their ignorance and brings them into bondage. He tries to persuade them that they are neglecting their duties to God by attending to other things. Now, you who are devoted to God should understand that if his providence should confine you at home to nurse the sick or prevent you from observing those hours of secret prayer that you are used to keeping, you are not to be brought into bondage or condemnation by this if you are conscious that these other duties are being done for the Lord. Whether you eat or drink, therefore, do all for the glory of God. All for the glory of God. And you can't be a glutton for the glory of God, but you can eat or drink for the glory of God. There's a right way to do something and there's a wrong way. Whether I talk about playing volleyball or playing ping pong, you can become in the flesh and competitive and hate the people who win. You know, they talk about being a good sport or a bad sport. Being a good sport is just loving your opponent as yourself. It's scriptural. You know, Doing unto them as you would wish they'd do unto you, whether they won or lost. If they won, you don't want them to gloat. And if they lose, you don't want them to pout. So you don't pout and you don't gloat. And if the person says that was my point and you thought it was your point and you, you talk about it a little bit and he still is firm, well, give him your cloak. Here, you have two points. Turn the other cheek. You know, The other cheek doesn't mean, all right, well, you play by yourself. What I'm saying is there's a Christian way to do just about everything because nothing in itself is good or evil the Bible says that. He says, I am convinced. Nothing in itself is good or evil. But why you do it? He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. You know? Now, there are certain things in themselves, literally, that are unlawful, like adultery or fornication. But really, adultery or fornication is sex. Okay? Sex is not unlawful with the right person at the right time. But with the wrong person at the wrong time is what makes it unlawful or the wrong motive. And that's the wrong person at the wrong time is what the wrong motive. Did you know that, you know, rape and incest and homosexual sex and all that other stuff is the same act done with the wrong person at the wrong time with the wrong motive as marital sex, which is godly and pleasing in his sight. So, and a knife, you know, you have a knife. With a knife, you can cut a bread, you can prepare a new meal, somebody's all tied up, you can release them from their captor, or you can slit somebody's throat. The knife isn't evil. The handgun isn't evil. You know that even the abortion operation isn't evil. My wife had a tubal pregnancy, and they had to go in, and the, in her case, it had already passed through when they went in to take it out. It had already passed through, she had a miscarriage. But they have to remove a woman's tubes. If her pregnancy attaches to the inside of the fallopian tube, it can kill her, and the baby can't come to term. So in that case, abortion is good. Because it's not evil. Because the motive is to save the life of the mother, and the baby can't be saved in that case. Do you understand what I'm saying? That there's no act 
I had to shoot my dog three weeks ago. He had cancer. You know, he was suffering. And I, I checked into having him put to sleep, and two different people told me, two, uh, two different people, and we read it somewhere, that, that when they put him to sleep, they suffer for a while. That it isn't like secondal. They don't just go to sleep. Their heart doesn't stop. But they're actually, they have, they have uh, uh, pain in that process. And I knew that a bullet through the head was not painful for the dog, but it would be painful for me. But I wanted to save the dog from pain, so I borrowed a gun and shot my dog of 10 years. It wasn't easy. It was not murder either. Because the motive was for its benefit. You understand? The motive made the shooting of a handgun, which is now illegal in a city in, in Illinois. And I'm not, I'm not for handgun, uh, that people should have handguns. I'm just saying that, again, the gun, which is so used in murder and robbery, wasn't evil in that case. The killing of something at that point wasn't evil in that case. Do you understand? So I'm talking again, motive sanctifies or defiles any action. Motive sanctifies or defiles any action. Okay, I killed my dog, but it was good. My wife went in to have a pregnancy removed, and it was good. Those are evil things in most cases, killing and, and abortion. But the Pharisees prayed and read the scriptures, and it was evil. Because the motive was wrong. So good things become evil, and bad things become good because you can sanctify or defile anything by motive. Does everybody understand that? Sorry to gross you out with such heavy illustrations. Three, others think that devotion can be sincere, but yet extend only to certain duties. That is, that a man may pray sincerely and from right motives, and yet be worldly in the transaction of business. Now, a little re reflection. A little reflection will convince any honest mind that this is naturally impossible. Devotion to God cannot be sincere any further than it annihilates selfishness. <laughs> what a line. Devotion to God cannot be sincere any further than it annihilates selfishness. Devotion and selfishness are eternal opposites. A, you, can, you can write that on your blackboard. Four, many mistake the religion of emotion for that of the religion of the will. You can see this from their lives. They weep and appear to melt and break down. They promise to change and offer entire consecration to God, but attempt to do business with them the very next day, and you will find them supremely selfish. They are not devoted to God at all, but to their own interests. They are ready to take any advantage, even of their brethren, to benefit themselves. How many people here have known somebody, a Christian like that? Honest, raise your hand. How many of you have known a Christian like that? Okay, just got to go around the block a couple more times. Attempt to do business with them the very next day, and you will find them supremely selfish. They are not devoted to God at all, but to their own interests. They are ready to take advantage even of their brethren to benefit themselves. Now, it is obvious in this case that their melting down and breaking down was merely a gushing of their emotions and not a will surrendered and devoted to God. Some helpful remarks. One, a spirit of devotion will turn the most constant cares and the most pressing labors into the deepest and most constant communion with God. That's a beautiful principle. A spirit of devotion will turn the most constant cares and the most pressing labors into the deepest and most constant communion with God. The more pressing and tedious our duties, if they are performed for God, the deeper and more continual our communion with Him. For whatever is done in a spirit of devotion is communion with God. Now, here's something that's going to, this will fry you. Two, they are not Christians who do not hold communion with God in their ordinary employments. They are not Christians who do not hold communion with God in their ordinary employments. If you do not hold conscious communion with God in your ordinary business, it is because your business is not performed in a spirit of devotion. If not performed in a spirit of devotion, it is sin. For whatever is not of faith is sin. How do you like that? For black and white. Three, they are certainly not in a sanctified state who cannot attend to the ordinary and lawful business of life without being drawn away from God. How many people have thought this way that, all right, I've said my prayers and I've read my Bible and now i got to go to work. 
And now I gotta go to school. Now I gotta go take care of grandma or whatever. Now I gotta go vacuum the rug. If only I could pray more, I wouldn't be drawn away from God by going to work. If only I could serve the Lord full time instead of work at this stupid bank. You know, then I could really love God. Oh, what hogwash. If God has brought you, or even if he hasn't brought you, if you brought you into a job and God isn't against you in that job, he hasn't said you're not supposed to be in this job, you're supposed to be on the mission field. You know, you're supposed to be a four-star Christian, not a three-star Christian. And you think, boy, you know, I really aren't close to God in this job. I wish I could pray more. Then your prayers are hypocritical. They're stupid. They don't mean a hill of beans unless you can take God with you to work. Does God go with you to work? Does he go with you to school? Does he go with you when you go home to visit your nagging mother? There's certainly not in a sanctified state who cannot attend to the ordinary and lawful business of life without being drawn away from God. Four, whatever cannot be done in a spirit of devotion is unlawful. If you feel the inconsistency of performing it as an act of devotion to God, it is unlawful, you yourself being the judge. Okay, now we get back to volleyball and cards and so on. Can you play volleyball in a spirit of devotion to God? Can you go bowling? Can you play pinball? Can you... Read the funnies on Sunday. Can you jog? In a now, if you can't, it says whatever cannot be done in a spirit of devotion for you is unlawful. You shouldn't do it. You yourself being the judge. If you go, oh man, this card game draws me from God. If it does, quit playing it. You know, eating hot fudge Sundays takes me from God. Don't eat them. Going over 55 takes me away from God. Don't do it. What you can't do in devotion, if you go, okay, I want to offer this volleyball game up to God, and your conscience says you can't. You're supposed to be over here. Better stop. You yourself being the judge that this can't be at this time in your life, or this time of the day, or this time of the week, or this time in your responsibilities, cannot be offered to God because your conscience is bothering you because you're supposed to be doing something else. Quit it immediately. But, if you're in prayer, I've got to get my hour in today. I promise God an hour. By the way, don't ever do that. It's a big mistake. Don't ever promise God the clock, ever. It's a big mistake. Don't ever promise God an amount of chapters or an amount of minutes. Now, somebody else might have told you something different. It's a big mistake. It will heap condemnation upon your soul until you fall on your face. Offer your whole life to God. Offer every second to God. Offer every word you read, whether it be in the Bible or in Tom Sawyer, to God. Or you will be crushed. You will be condemned by your own conscience and by the devil. So anyway, you're going along, and you've got to get your hour in, and your friend calls, your unsaved friend, and says, hey, you want to go play racquetball? Um, no, I'm serving God, brother. I, I can't play right now. God might say, shut your trap and go play racquetball, man, and be show this person that you got flesh and blood and a heart and a mind and a body and a soul and a Jesus. And that you like to have fun because people like to have fun and God made them that way. Not to have too much fun, not to have more fun than they work and pray and serve and serve God in the other things. But God made us as little lambs. He made us that way. He calls us his sheep. You ever seen a little lamb kicking around in the, in the field? You ever seen a calf running around? We're all children at heart. When the children were playing around Jesus, do you think he didn't enjoy it? When they were laughing and giggling and tear, pulling at his robe and saying, Hey, Jesus, can I come up? Hey, you know, don't you think he played with them? Oh, my children. They think of him as Vincent Price sometimes, you know? <laughs> Don't you think that God enjoys it when his children enjoy the life that he gave them? Not in excess. No, no, no. 
You should work more than you play. Of course you should. There's only so many hours in a week. But God would like you. He doesn't mind you taking some of that for recreation because he put that in our hearts. It's not the devil. John Wesley was somebody who was seeking after God. He was trying to find out what was pleasing to God. And he thought, well, he saw all these kids playing in the street and beating up on each other and being competitive and being uh, vicious toward each other and calling each other names and hurting each other and causing pain and sorrow. You know how kids are in junior high, right? You know, hey, Schmitty, you know, you're, you're a crummy kickball player, whatever, you know. They hurt each other. They call each other names, you know. You know, there's... There's a, you know, the guy that's always striking out. They call him strikeout, you know, because he's always striking out. He's walking around with a name all over his face. Strikeout. He can't stand it. Wherever he goes, he's strikeout. So John Wesley had an idea. Boom. Well, since all of this play is causing them so much pain, what we should do is start a school and forbid children to play. So they can't play anymore. And he did it. He started a school and the children couldn't play. And it was, of course, a miserable failure. The children were so depressed and so pent up, they couldn't think. And he realized it wasn't playing that was wrong, but the motives, they needed to be taught sportsmanship. They needed to be taught sharing. They needed to be taught goodness towards each other and preferring the other person. That wasn't the deed that was wrong again. Right? You understand? So you're praying and you're doing your thing and the guy says, can you play racquetball with me? And you know this guy, somebody... That God wants to lead to the Lord, you better go play racquetball with him. Put your prayer books down, put your Bible down, and go play racquetball. And don't go to play racquetball, go to serve God. Go to be, this is a misused word, a witness. You know, that doesn't mean when you win, you go, hallelujah, praise God, you know. <laughs> or, you know, or you lose, well, hallelujah anyway, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's not real. I mean, it can be, the, if it's really the true gushing forth of your heart, that's okay. But that's not witnessing. <laughs> it doesn't say any about place in the Bible that you should go out and witness. It says you should be a witness. It doesn't say any place in the Bible you should go witnessing. It says you should go into all nations making disciples of men. We've got this whole perverted Christianity today that tries to make everything into a deed, a little package thing where we have, you know, we have instant Quaker Oats and instant tea, and now we've got instant Christian. Just add prayer and stir. You know? All you've got, everything's instant. We've got instant witnessing, you know. Instant witnessing. You wear your Jesus shirt. You wear your Jesus bumper sticker. You wear your Jesus belt. You wear your Jesus underwear. And you use your Jesus toothpaste. You know? That's crazy. A truly devoted person doesn't need paraphernalia to be a witness. He's got the Holy Spirit. And if he doesn't have the Holy Spirit, then he's got to go down to the local bookstore and buy all this stuff to show he's a Christian. Now, I'm not saying that those that have those things don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm saying they don't really need them. In fact, some of them are distracting and bring a bad light to the gospel. <clears throat> Devotion means at any time you're ready, willing, and able to do anything for God, even if it doesn't look spiritual to the world. Okay? So again, for whatever cannot be done in a spirit of devotion is unlawful, if you feel the inconsistency of performing it as an act of devotion to God, it is unlawful, you yourself being the judge. Anything not right or wrong in itself may be either right or wrong according to whether or not it is done in the spirit of devotion. Therefore, six, so these are two heavy, or this is these two paragraphs, really heavy principles. A selfish mind may condemn a godly man for doing something that would be sinful if he himself did it because the motives of his heart are all wrong. The selfish man assumes that the other person's behavior is also wrongly motivated. You ever thought of that? Have you ever knew that it was wrong for you to eat hot? You're on a diet, right? You shouldn't be eating hot food Sundays. You go out with this guy. Don't you hate these people? You know, they can eat anything and they stay skinny, right? Can't stand them. I've been struggling with my weight since I'm 16 years old. You know, people like Annie Herring, you know. Any hearing could eat a football field and look the same the next day. You know? I can't stand that. So for me, when I eat too much and God wants me to remain, keep my temple in shape and he wants me to be a good witness and not look like the good year blimp, then it's sin for me to overeat. Now, if she's eating 
for her flesh, it's sin for her to overeat too. But if she isn't and she realizes that, you know, God made food and I'm thankful for it and I like to eat, you know, yard long pizza burgers, you know, and, and, it, and it doesn't stumble her or anybody else or God, and she can go right ahead and do it. And what's sin for me? And then I see her doing that. Oh, what a glutton, you know. Because my motive in eating it would be gluttony. But her motive is she is worshiping God. You understand? You can, you can look through your glasses, what you look at the world at every day, and think that everybody else is looking through the same glasses, and read into them the bad motives that you have if you did the same thing. On the other hand, this is great. On the other hand, a sanctified mind may give credit to a selfish mind when it is not due, taking it for granted that when the act is right, the motive is right. That's the exact opposite. Some evil guy comes to church. Hey, man, there was a guy at this church in Sacramento that came to this church, and he stayed there for six months, and he was one of those Christian musicians. You know, hey, Jesus loves me. You know, he was singing for God, right? And he played the guitar and did all his riffs for Christ. Well... He joined one of the local bands and laid low, was really, praise God, hallelujah, taught a Bible study, drove people to church, Sunday school, trusted as can be. New Year's Eve comes around and he says, he calls up all the band members individually and says, I have a gig to play tonight, can I borrow your instrument? Each one of them takes the van around, takes their instruments, never heard from them again. Steals them. Not one there wasn't one sign that he was like that. Beware. People will come into your midst as ravening wolves. Will slip in. I pray. We pray as a ministry all the time because we have people coming and going in our ministry. We pray, God, don't let a wolf come, please. Because the wolf, I guarantee you, a wolf will not look like a wolf. A wolf will look like this. Because you have a godly mind. You should as a Christian. You think the best. And so you might give credit where credit is not due, thinking that, Taking it for granted that when the act is right, the motive is right. Beware for men. Beware of men. Remember Jesus said, beware of men? That doesn't mean we should be suspicious of people. It means we should be careful. Seven. There is no peace of mind but in a state of devotion. No other state of mind is reasonable. I like that. In no other state will the powers of the mind harmonize. In any other state than that of devotion to God, there is an inward struggle and mutiny and strife in the mind itself. The conscience rebukes the heart for selfishness. Hence, there is no peace, saith my God, for the wicked. Eight, they have perfect peace whose minds are thus stayed upon God in an attitude of constant devotion. It is impossible that they should not have peace, for devotion implies and includes peace. And now, beloved, do you have the spirit of true devotion? Do not reply, I hope so, for nothing but a conscious awareness should satisfy you for one moment. If you are devoted to God, you know it. And if you are not conscious of being devoted to God, it is because you are not devoted. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this shall he also reap. For he that sows to the flesh shall reap from the flesh corruption, but he that sows to the spirit shall reap from the spirit life everlasting. Okay, somebody just asked, how do you get your motive straight? And that's the key question. That's like, the, that's like the rich young ruler going up to Jesus and saying, what do I do to be saved? It really is. Sin is, remember it said that selfishness and devotion were eternal opposites? By drawing close to Jesus, and, and these, are, these are cliches, these are cliches, but they're not if you know Jesus, Repenting, becoming, uh, finding out what holiness is. Holiness is, is drawing close to God and becoming like Him. You know, you always become like the people you hang out with. You know that? If you hang out in New York, you start to looking like this. Hang out in Arkansas, start talking like this. You know? Really. If you hang out with hoodlums, you become a hoodlum. If you hang out with cultured people, you become cultured. I'm serious. And if you hang out with God, you become godly. If you hang out with demons, you become demonic. If you hang out with the Holy Spirit, now these these are all easy answers. Now, there are some things you can't explain to somebody with words. Just like if you never tasted chocolate ice cream and you said, what does chocolate ice cream taste like? What could I say? 
Uh, it's wet, it's brown, it's cold. Uh, sweet. That doesn't tell you anything about chocolate. But brown, cold, sweet, that's, that's snow with sugar in it. You know, with, with brown food coloring. You know? Or other stuff, dirt. <laughs> You've got to come to know the Lord. And I know that you know that you believe you know the Lord, and I don't I don't know that you don't. But I'll tell you this. I struggle with my motives. Peter struggled with his motives. And if you believe the interpretation of Romans seven that half the church believes, Paul struggled with his motives. And uh Finney struggled with his. You read his autobiography, he had some he had some struggling times. Life's a struggle. The flesh and the spirit are a constant struggling and at war with each other. That's a promise, by the way. Hey, you know, everybody likes to talk about the promises of God, you know. They, they say, you know, God is love. And, uh, you know, ask whatever you wish, it shall be done for you. Well, there's other promises of God. Those who wish to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Claim that one. <laughs> the spirit and the war are. The spirit and the flesh are at war with each other, you know. You get your motives right by examining them, but not too close, because you can spend the rest of your life examining your motives instead of God. And one by one, repenting, getting clear, going back to the people that you've offended with bad motives, going back to God who you've offended with any bad motive you've had, and by the grace of God, through the love of God, and in the time of God, by the way, every Christian virtue takes time to make into a habit. What is habit, anyway? Habit is the is continually doing something, learning to do it over and over and over again until it becomes second nature. You know, you hear, I'm sure in the school you hear about sin nature and all this other stuff. Well, this is second nature. Habit is second nature. It takes time. E.M. Bounds says it takes 20 years to make a man a god. Len Ravenhill, who's, who's been a preacher for 60 years now, told me when he first heard that as a young man, he rebelled against it until he was a Christian 20 years and then he knew it was true. <laughs> Time. It takes time, prayer, resting in Him, effort, and it definitely takes God. And I, I hope that's not a too simplistic answer for you. The question was, how do you apply a devotional state of mind to everything you do? You've got to look through everything to Jesus. You've got to see His hand in everything. You gotta see his hand when you go to work. You have to see his hand while you're driving. You gotta see his hand giving you the food. Remember we say grace, okay? That, that's, that can be a stupid tradition unless we're really thanking God for the food. You have to look at him as if he placed the food on the table. Because he really did. There's no food that he didn't grow. There's no food prepared that he didn't make the person to prepare it and give him the intelligence and energy to do it with. So he's actually feeding the whole universe. He's keeping your heart beating. But you've got to, Look through everything you do to God and see Him in everything, and then it's easy to be devoted to Him. Otherwise, if you look at it, well, I left God back at church on Sunday, or I left Him this morning when I prayed, then your mind isn't on God, and it says whatever is pure, whatever is worthy of praise, set your mind on these things. That's making habits, too, habits of thought. Can that just be a frame of mind on leaving, like getting up from prayer and walking out and... Uh... Maybe because you just don't feel it. Yeah. You can feel like you've left the presence of the Lord or something like that. Well, as, as, as Finney said about feelings, the religion of the emotion, um, it's a fact that God is with you wherever you go. David said, if I made my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now, that means everywhere you go, you know. Um, I, I really want to make it clear that that this study isn't giving you any answers, it's just telling you what you shouldn't do and what the state of mind you should be in. Just like the girl says, how do you get your motives right? Well, when the rich young ruler ran before Jesus, Jesus says, well, keep the commandments, you know? He says, I've done that. Well, and there's one you haven't done, I'll tell you in the other way. Get rid of everything you own and follow me, because you've got a covetous spirit. Jesus was so practical, he could pinpoint. Now, if I knew you, I could say, what you need to do is quit playing this and quit thinking that's person, and, but I can't do that. And all I can say is for myself, it's take God with me out of the prayer closet. Let him come with me. In my conscious mind, take God with me. Take him with you. 
When you go, when you leave the house, when you leave your Bible study, when you leave church, make sure you take them with you. I always say that. I, I, we used to have Bible studies every night in the early community. I used to say, when I was done praying, I said, God, now, amen is not goodbye. <laughs> you know? Amen doesn't mean, see you later, Lord. It means, I'm going to quit talking to you now, and I'm going to start talking to the students. And you're with me. You're speaking through me if you live in me, hopefully. You're speaking through all my brothers and sisters. If the Holy Spirit lives in us, he should come out through our eyes, through our actions, and through our words. Now, this is a high, high standard. You get a nosebleed, it's so high. I mean, it, it, it's frightening when you think about the life of service to God in reality. It's frightening compared to what we're used to. You know, it's not hard to become one of the top ten members of your church. You can be one of the, you can be in the top ten spiritually in your church. All you got to do is show up at all the meetings and volunteer to go into the nursery every now and then, and uh, you know, wiggle your fingers when you worship and do you know, know where Habakkuk is in the Bible. So when the pastor says you turn there first and all kinds of stuff, you can you can be in the top ten. And the most spiritual guy in our church today is on the bottom rung of what God really wants for the church. I think. And the, and the potential, as we as Christians, when those early Christians went out, they changed the world. They didn't go like we go. We, we go to church people, in most cases in America. We go to people who are civilized. These people, went to, these people went to people in the same line as today would be going to Mormons or Muslims or, or, or Buddhists or whatever. They went to the heathen who were worshiping multiplicity of gods, who were burning their children in the fire, who were having sex with animals, who were doing all kinds of crazy and stupid things, and won them to the Lord by droves. They had power, and their power was not their words, but their lives, their commitment to God. <clears throat> the question is, technically, when we receive Jesus, isn't it true our eternal life starts right then? This is a great misunderstanding of the modern church. What is eternal life? Hallelujah. What is eternal life? What is it? To know Jesus. Nope. What is eternal life? Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Guess what eternal life is? Jesus is eternal life. Jesus himself. If you walk with Jesus, you walk with eternal life. When you walk away from Jesus, you walk away. Eternal life isn't a little bag that God gives you. It says, here, don't lose this. And you put it in your thing. That's the way people think. This is, I will give them eternal life. All that means is they will live forever. That's what eternal life means. It's literally, I will live forever. But Jesus himself is the life of the universe. He holds all things together. All things were created for him, through him, by him, because of him. He is the life. Now, when you have eternal life, you have Jesus living in your... The Holy Spirit dwells within you, and Jesus walks with you. And the, it's, Jesus says that I and my Father will come and make our abode with you. You walk away from God. I mean walk away. I'm talking about divorce. You turn around and say, you know, goodbye. I'm splitting. You walk away from Christ. You walk away from eternal life. Because he is eternal life. If you have this view that it's a bag, you know, it's like Monty Hall giving you a bag. Here, you have eternal life, you know. If you think in those kind of thoughts, you know, kids are like that. Little kids, they're very geometrical. You say, Jesus came into your heart. They say, a little valentine with a door down here, you know. Jesus goes, and walks in, you know. They, Jesus came into my heart. They see this little valentine, you know. We, still being children, all of us are just children in, in older bodies in disguise, um, that you know what? That's why when people grow old, they get senile. They just quit playing the game. You know? <laughs> uh, all of us, if, as being like children, we think of Jesus says He'll give us eternal life. That's just like you know the stupid Jews, and I'm a stupid Jew, said, "Well, how can we eat your flesh, man? I can't bite into your arm." You know, they didn't realize He was talking to. They didn't realize that He was talking to them about. Consuming him, having him become part of him. What does food do? It becomes part of you. What does drink do? It cleanses you out and it becomes part of your very being. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Let him be consumed by God. Consume Jesus. Let him become part of you. So that when food becomes part of your body, it's inseparable from you. 
So you said technically when we get saved, when we meet Jesus, your eternal life starts right there. Yes, technically you're right. But remember that the eternal life is Christ himself. Jesus said, I have the life within myself and I give it to whomever I wish. 